Okay, so there's a small change in the, cor in the title. I've corrected it so that it reads Detection, Diagnosis, and Correction of Batch Effects and TCGA Data because I hate to be the bearer of bad news. So here's good news. We actually are able to correct some of the batch effects that we see. And the, the really good news is there aren't many batch effects to begin with. But, so here's the simplified flow diagram for the TCGA data. I'm sure you saw Kenna's presentation earlier. This is a very simplified diagram of how the process works. So we have these multiple tissue source sites, and then they send their samples to the BCRs, which in turn extract the DNA and RNA and send them to the uh, genome characterization centers and genome sequencing centers which in turn then produce the data that goes to the DCC, which goes to the TCGA website. So there are many potential points at which batch effects can be introduced. They can be introduced at the tissue source site level, they can be introduced at the BCR level, the GCC level, and so on. So the first step is once we have the data, that's all we have, we have the data at the end. The objective is to detect or quantify any batch effects that we might see, and to identify sources of those batch effects if possible. We use certain tools for the diagnosis of those batch effects. We at MD Anderson uh, GDAC have developed this tool called MBatch, which is an R package that's available uh, from that URL that you see. And it has multiple tools there. For example, it has PCA plus, which is a novel algorithm that we developed. It's an enhancement of the traditional PCA plot. There's a batch core algorithm that we have developed, which is again a novel algorithm. There's hierarchical clustering, which you're all familiar with. Clinical correlates with the, cl with the clusters. We have box plots, and we have ANOVA and MANOVA. There's a disclaimer. Obviously, there's no substitute for human input. These are just tools. They allow you to look at the data, but then what to do with it, the final decision, that relies on the user. So I'm not going to go through each one of those uh, tools in great detail, but I'm going to show you a few screenshots so that you have an idea of what I'm talking about. So if you look at the traditional PCA plot, this is what it looks like. And uh, I don't know about you, but for me, I can't really tell anything you know, interesting from such PCA plots. So we have uh, so these enhancements, and now what you see is a PCA plus plot. It's exactly the same plot. The points are the same, except we have connected each of the points by their batch centroids. So what you see is each of the solid points that you see here, they are actually batch centroids, and from here you can see that one of the batches, which is batch 29 in this case, stands out from the rest. So this is how you can identify that there's potentially something weird or something different about that one batch. We've also, we've also uh, introduced a metric called DSC, Dispersion Separability Criterion, that quantifies the differences between these batches. Anything that has a value close to zero is good. Between zero and, let's say, 0.3, you know, it's not too bad. Uh, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, you should be somewhat concerned. 0 0.5 and above, you should be really concerned. Here's the other algorithm. Uh, this is called batch core. And what it, ha what it does is it produces numbers and the between 0 and 1. The closer the number is to 1, the better it is. Anything that's less than 0 0.5 or less than 0 0.7, you need to be a little bit concerned about. But we've also introduced p-values there. So you have not only the metric itself, but p-values to social statistical associations. So again, in this case, you can see that batch 29 is somewhat problematic in this case, for example. We have hierarchical clustering, which you're all familiar with. We've annotated hierarchical clustering with tissue source site, batch ID, ship date, plate ID, and VCR, uh, among other variables. So these are some of the variables that we are studying it by. And then we have the clinical correlates. So these clinical correlates, um, if you have, for example, in this case, we have the colorectal uh, data. So you can see, well, if you look at the histological type, I know you can't read it, but that's histological type. If you see that, you, you get excited and you say, well, we get a separate cluster for histological type. And we also see that uh, colon data and the rectal data, they are separated out. So maybe the microRNA expression profiles of rectal data is different from colon. But then we see that rectal data sets were processed in a completely different batch. So they are confounded by that batch, and we can't say for sure whether any differences are because of batch or because of biology. So there is some confounding that you will occasionally see. Now, with a large project as TCGA, you know, we know that we have some of the best scientists produ producing this data. But it's such a complicated project that it's inevitable that sometimes you might end up with a few batch effects here and there. But like I said earlier, the good news is that we've analyzed most of them, and there are very few batch effects to begin with. And when there are batch effects, we hope we're catching them um, in time. 
Here's another example. We have these box plots. So in the box plots, you can see uh, this is plotted by batch medians or by batch means. Um, and you can see over here that batch 29 has low expression. So there, that's a suspect batch. Then we have, then we have ANOVA and MANOVA tools. Um, and this actually quantify the amount of variance that can be explained by any one variable. So the amount of variance that can be explained by batch ID or by TSS or by BCR or even by subtype, which is a good uh, variable. We want the variance by subtype to be maximized. So it shows you all of those variables in a neat Venn diagram. One caveat about batch 29 that I'm talking about continuously, it's actually confounded with subtypes. So it's actually one unique subtype of colorectal data, which is why it may very well be biology. The differences might be due to biology rather than technical effects. But because it's confounded, we can't be sure one way or the other. Okay, so if you do see a batch effect, what do you do? How do you uh, correct for that? So of course you want to correct the source of the problem whenever possible, right? That's a pretty obvious thing. But when it's not possible or the source is unknown, then the algorithms, uh, different bio bioinformatics algorithm can be used. For example, some algorithms that are there in the mBatch package that uh, we are offering is uh, Combat, which is empirical Bayes, ANOVA, and Median Polish, and there are two flavors of each, so a total of six algorithms. So this is at the, uh, this particular URL that I've highlighted over here. The package is up for download. So now let me move on to an interesting story that came about in kidney DNA methylation data. And uh, this story sort of ev evolved, and this is to give you an idea of how we, if we, if we use the tools and how we can use the tools in order to narrow down what the problem is. So we worked with the USC in order to narrow down this particular problem. When we first saw kidney DNA methylation data, we saw a dichotomy, and that was weird. So we drilled down to it and we found that the dichotomy was due to male and female patients. So the next thing we did was we removed the sex chromosomes. So after removing sex chromosomes, the same figure looked like that. Again, we see a dichotomy, but the new dichotomy corresponds perfectly with batch ID. So then we drilled down into the data. We, we collaborated with USC and uh, USC informed us that they'd done some controls, experiments, and so on. And they identified a few probes that were suspect. Now, when I say a few, I mean really few. We're talking about 27,000 probes that were there in this data set. Out of that, 150 probes are responsible for the batch effects that you see over there. Only 150 out of 27,000. So we removed those 150 suspect probes, and then this is the figure that we get. Well, it's improved, but I put my, head, my hand to my head again because I saw another dichotomy, and I'm like, okay, this is the third time that we're seeing a dichotomy. What's going on? Lo and behold, these are chromophobe samples. So it turns out that these samples were chromophobes that were not identified as chromophobes by the clinician. And there's a long story behind that. I'm sure you guys know that there were some chromophobe samples in kidney that were eventually removed from there uh, so that we have pure renal cell uh, carcinomas. But this just shows you, you know, you have dichotomy, you got to drill down. You can't just trust on the tools and say, okay, the tool is saying uh, there's a batch effect, so I should take it for granted. Finally, I'm going to talk a little bit about the TCG MBatch website that we've put up. That's the URL for the website. It's the same URL uh, that you saw earlier. And I'm going to switch to a live demo and keep my fingers crossed. So when you go to the URL, this is what you see. This is the documentation page. And you're going to see two green buttons there, which will offer you either you can download the MBatch package. If you do that, then this is the page that you end up with. We've got a Linux version and a, and a Windows version, and we've got documentation for the uh, batch effects uh, package. The alternative is you can launch the TCGA batch effects website directly. So if you want to launch the TCGA batch effects website, this is what you would end up with. On the left-hand side, you can select you know, different parameters, like what disease you're interested in, what data type, and uh, what center, what data level. Right now, we just offer level three. Uh, so level, what level you want, and then um, whether you want the original data or corrected data. I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. But here we have the assessment algorithms. As of right now, we have hierarchical clustering and PCA to choose from. Uh, and which variable you want to categorize by, batch ID or tissue source site or whatever other variable you want to categorize by. Um, and then you get this particular PCA plot. Now, cool thing about this plot is you can mouse over it. So if I clear this window right here and I say, well, let me see what that particular outlier sample is, I just mouse over it and I see all the information regarding that particular sample in the window that's in the data point log. And I can mouse over multiple points and later on select all, copy paste into my favorite text editor or whatever the program that I want and drill down into what those samples represent. The DSC values are also given over here uh, for your convenience. I can also zoom in into the plot, and uh, I can pan around, 
and see you know, whatever area of the plot that I'm interested in. So zooming, panning, and mouse over capabilities are included, among other features. What is also included in there is, well, if you want to see the compendium of TCGA data and see, OK, where are batch effects in uh, TCGA data, or which data sets are likely to have batch effects in them, then you can actually click on this button, which says algorithm specific scores. And when you do that, you will end up with this DSC table. Over here, you, are, you have your disease type. Um, your, your, this is the name of the disease, the disease type, data type, and so on, all the information regarding a particular data set. And at the end of that, you'll see if you scroll to your right, you will see the DSC value. And you can sort by any one of these columns. In this case, I've sorted by DSC. So I'm going to see the highest DSCs. Uh, um, basically, this is in uh, descending order. So when you see a high DSC value, you can go and look at, OK, that's the data set that is showing me the highest DSC value. So you go to that particular data set. So for example, one of the data sets in which we saw a relatively high DSC value was this data set. Uh, this is a prostate cancer data. And we see two batches, and they're quite different from each other. So when they're different from each other, what we can do is, once we've exhausted all other options of you know, getting the data corrected, then we can actually go ahead and download the corrected data. So here, if you, uh, we have corrections by many different algorithms, like I mentioned. This is empirical base. So this is before the data was corrected. This is the original data as you download it from the DCC. And this is the data after it's been corrected by, by empirical base. So you can clearly see that you know, the centroids match up. Um, and you can actually download this data. The way you get to that data is simple. You just go to the data set. Instead of original, you say corrected by batch ID. And that will update automatically. And uh, you're going to see a figure that has been corrected. If you say, OK, I want to download this particular data now that's been corrected, you go to related documents. And there you have this document that is about 800 megabytes long. So I'm not going to download it right now, obviously. But uh, you can download that, and you will get your corrected data. But again, word of caveat, uh, a caveat and a disclaimer, only download corrected data if you need to. If you don't see a batch effect, don't download corrected data, because the side effect of any correction algorithm is that some of the biology may, quote unquote, be corrected. In other words, some of the variants that you want to see in the biology might also be corrected for. So, um, so that's a basic demo of the website. And like I said, uh, that's the URL for the website. Um, so I'm just going to skip over this as I just showed that to you. And I would like to conclude with acknowledgments. We worked uh, closely. This is our group at MD Anderson. And we worked uh, closely with the in silico uh, people. And uh, that's, my, that's my email address right there. If you have any questions, please feel free to email me. I also have a poster, poster number 50. And uh, here's the URL once again. Thank you. Rehan, thank you. Question. Hello, Mehmet uh, Basin from NCI. Uh, normalization has an effect uh, on the batch effects. So the data that you show, is it the raw data or the normalized data? It's data at level three, which by definition has been normalized to a certain extent depending on which data type we're talking about. But yes, it's level three data that I just showed to you. And that's uh, the MBatch website uh, plans to do uh, regular runs of the data. So the data is automatically downloaded from DCC and shown to you as is. OK, have you made any comparison on the raw data to, to see what part of the batch effect is reduced by normalization? So that's data at level one and level two. And to be honest, we have not looked at that primarily because of the size of the data that's involved. At level three, you have considerably reduced size. And even then, it takes us two to three weeks to get this run there. So for level one, which could be you know, 10 to 100 times larger, that's just not practical at this point to look at level one data. But if you are interested in specific data sets, then you can certainly download the mBatch package and run it yourself at your end and look for batch effects at level one or level two. Thank you, Rehan.